All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome. This is our Science of Fall series. So this is Science of Opossum. So uh, my name is Monica McCubrey. I am the Wildlife Education Specialist with the Nebraska Game and Parks Commission out of the Lincoln office. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about all about possums. So um, just their cool adaptations that they have, um, a little bit of evolutionary history, and then just some myths that surround them. They're kind of a weird animal. A lot of people find them a nuisance animal. Um, a lot of people don't know anything about them. So they kind of have created over time a lot of the myths that surround them. So we're going to hopefully bust a couple of those myths today, but then also um, just give you some more information about these animals that are so common um, throughout much of Nebraska and also throughout the United States that people see quite frequently, um, but just maybe don't know a lot about. So we will go ahead and get started. I will share my screen with everybody. I just added one more picture. I just had to had to do one more photo here. Um, but we will go ahead and get started. Sorry, everyone. So many tabs open. Don't know what's happening. All right. And I will still be letting people in as well, just so you all know. Maybe? Okay. All right. Welcome, everyone. Like I mentioned, this is Science of Possum. So um, it's funny that I have this photo here. I thought it was too adorable not to put on the very front screen here. Um, we'll talk about animals that can hang by their tail. Um, there's a lot of myths surrounding whether possums can actually do this or not. We will go ahead and cover that later today, I promise. Um, but I just thought it was a very cute photo that I couldn't pass up. Um, if you've been on Science of before, um, I, the idea is that just giving you a little bit of information um, about some of the little in-depth about some of these nature topics that we see, um, but also letting people know that I want you to comment, I want you to ask questions. Just make sure that if you do that in the chat, you are keeping it on topic and that you are kind to everyone. Otherwise, we do have that right to remove you. I also want to point out that I am not a opossum expert. Um, I have taught about them a lot. I know quite a bit about them, but definitely have not studied them all my life. Um, I'm not an expert on any of the topics that I've done, um, but I do a ton of research. Um, I am a science communicator. I'm a wildlife education specialist. I have a master's in wildlife, um, an undergrad in wildlife. So I have some experience, but um, if you ask questions that I don't know, I will find someone that does know the answer to those and I will get back to you. So um, we're going to go ahead and get going. We're going to talk about, like I mentioned, possums. So there's a little bit of a different way. A lot of people um, don't know the difference. A lot of people don't know there is a difference. So when I say like accent or accentuate the opossums, um, I won't do that the entire time, but there's a difference between possums and possums. So today we're going to be talking about the opossums, not the p-possum. So um, what's the difference? Why is this a big deal? Why am I making this such a big deal? So um, when we talk about possums and opossums, it's not the same animal. It's just a different pronunciation. I see a a lot of people write possum when they spell it out, especially even here in Nebraska, they spell it with a P and they forget that O. They're just like, oh, the O is silent. Um, yes and no. Um, so this is a common misconception. A lot of people use the word synonymously with each other, possum and opossum. Um, truth be told, these animals are very different from each other, but they are related to each other. So um, even though these animals are related, they're kind of different animals altogether. And overall, they're ending up in different areas. So um, if you've seen a possum in Nebraska, hopefully that they don't look like this. Um, otherwise, that would be something different. And that absolutely should be um, observed and recorded. But they will look different here. I'll show you a picture of the ones that you should be seeing here in Nebraska and throughout North America. Um, but the proper name for what we call animals in North America, um, we call them Virginia opossum. So if you've ever heard someone use that full, um, full name, uh, Virginia opossum, that is what we have here in North America. Um, both possum and opossum come from the word opossum, and I don't know if I pronounced that correctly, um, but it means white animal in Powhatan. So um, these animals are indigenous to North America. The ones that we will see here in a second are very different than the ones that you would see in places like South America or Australia. So um, here's just a quick video of what you would see here in Nebraska. They may look just a tad different. There's no audio, um, just so that people know, um, but this is what they look like here in Nebraska. They kind of have this very pointed muzzle, the rounded ears, the scale-like tail. Um, you'll see kind of they look like they've gone through the dryer. They have like bristly hair. 
Um, those are those guard hairs. Um, and then the under fur is very soft for underneath. This is a different type of possum. This is the most common possum that you would see. It's called a brush tail possum. Um, these guys are very different, um, different color, different habitat, different ear types. Their faces are a little bit more scrunched. Um, their feet are different. Um, their body size is different. So these are ones that we don't necessarily see here. This is one that you would find like in Australia. So very, very common, even in large cities like Sydney, Australia. Um, but the ones that we see here are those Virginia or the North American possums. So when I talk about a possum, there's a suborder, about 70 tree living marsupial species native to Australia, Indonesia, islands of New Guinea, um, and I don't know how to pronounce that last name, um, but these animals are solitary. They're nocturnal, very similar to the possums that we have here in Nebraska. Um, they're highly adapted to living around people. Um, these are one of those animals when we talk about urban wildlife, they've done very well around people, and sometimes they even thrive better with people. So um, not saying that they need people to survive by any means, but they're easy. There's area, areas where you can get easy meals. There's times that they can find shelter. There's areas where they can go if it's really cold during the winter time. These are just some of those animals that have done well around people. Um, it's not a bad thing. But um, a lot of possums, especially that brush tail possum that I showed you a video of, they're very similar. They're just the Australia version. So um, these possums, just in general, very similar to like a koala. They have evolved over time to feed on animals that are poisonous um, to other animals. So they've kind of filled that niche in certain areas. Um, many possums are also in danger of extinction. That's very different than the opossum that we have here in North America. Um, about a quarter of all those um, species are uh, either threatened or endangered in their areas. All right, so opossums. This is what we have here in Nebraska. That was the last time that I will emphasize the opossums, but um, these are the only native marsupial found here in North America. So what is the marsupial? It simply means that the female possesses a pouch where she will hold and carry her baby. So um, that's very different than a lot of other animals here in Nebraska. When I think of pouch, I think of wombat, kangaroo, um, koala, all of those marsupial type animals that you would think about in places like Australia. So um, these animals are about roughly the size of a raccoon, usually about two to three feet long, about the size of a large cat or a small dog. They're, um, they have these really long pointed snouts that I mentioned earlier. Um, the tail, I know it's very hard to see, but you can kind of just see it hanging down from the tree limb there. They're very scaly. They're almost like a rat tail. They don't have a lot of hair on them, but they do have small little bristle hairs. Um, these guys have almost like cartoon like ears. They're very circular. They don't have hair on them. And then looking at their feet, they're very odd. They do have opposable thumbs. Um, they do have like a handprint and it's a very distinctive track. If you ever see this, a lot of people sometimes have a hard time telling the difference between a raccoon track and a possum track. Raccoons always look like a tiny little human hand. Possums, they have this weird kind of thumb that sticks out to the side and it looks like an alien. Um, so it's very, very identifiable when you see that. Um, there's a lot of myths surrounding can possums hang from their tails. The young can do it for a few seconds. Um, adults are actually too heavy. So um, it, there's a lot of different um, videos, cartoons, movies that showed possums hanging from trees while they sleep, kind of like bats. This is absolutely false. Now the ones here do not do that. They're too heavy. They can't hang by their tail. They do use their tail as almost like a fifth appendage. It is prehensile, so it can grip onto things, but it just can't hold the weight of the animal like hanging down. Um, so they do help them climb it helps them keep their balance in a tree um, and it does kind of help them move around but they cannot hang from it and then these animals are also omnivorous so they're eating pretty much anything they eat fruit plants they'll eat snakes ticks small mammals mice um, pet food really anything that they can find um, and we all know that they're not um, too proud to go out and eat some garbage or things that people leave out so again they are okay around people and they do sometimes fairly well around the urban landscapes 
All right. So what's their urban, their, what's their uh, evolutionary history? So marsupials were obviously a direct descendant of what's called Luca, the least universal common ancestor. Um, we believe that they were established around 180 to 130 million years ago. Um, so when mammals kind of arose, there's different subsets of mammals. Um, placental mammals would be something like a coyote um, or a human. So there's a placenta. Um, the way that they give birth is very different than compared to a marsupial. Marsupial. Marsupials give uh, birth to underdeveloped young, and then they come and they kind of um, bake in the pouch or they grow and develop in the pouch for a while, and then they were able to go off on their own. So um, the marsupial kind of radiation separated from the placental mammals. Um, about 180 million years ago, um, we all heard of Pangaea, the supercontinent. It separated, and this separation basically isolated marsupials to Australia, Antarctica, and South America. So South America, um, the animals basically what happened, South America and North America were connected at one point, and through the Isthmus of Panama, um, these animals kind of slowly wandered north, and they successfully ended up, which is now North America. Um, their home range after about a the last 100 years has very much increased. So we're seeing possums in lots of different places that we would not have seen about 100 years ago. All right. So that was like a very, very quick, what is a possum? Not a possum, but an opossum. And then talking about their evolutionary history. So let's go ahead and head into their morphology. Um, so their characteristics, we've talked a little bit about these, but like I mentioned, they're a medium-sized mammal about the size of a cat or a small dog. Um, they live about one to three years in the wild, which is not very long. Um, in adulthood, they have 50 teeth. This is more than any other terrestrial mammal. So we'll go in depth about their teeth here in a little bit, but already they're marsupials. They have a ton of teeth. Um, they have this weird pouch or this weird kind of body shape too. Um, they always look just like rugged or like they've just had a really hard week. Um, every time I see a possum, they're just like frantic. Um, their fur is really dense. Um, they do have under fur, it's long, but usually they're a gray or a black color. Um, the hairs that you see sticking out are what we call guard hairs. These are the ones that are a little coarser, they're a little longer. And then if you kind of move past those guard hairs underneath, we call that under fur. And it's a little bit more curly and it's a little bit more soft. It's almost like the insulation. Um, so these guys, they also can, um, Sometimes they're white, sometimes gray, black, depending on the color and the density of these guard hairs, but they're usually kind of a gray color. Um, however, Nebraska has seen some what we call cinnamon colored or kind of a brownish, kind of a, um, a light color. Um, and there have been albino versions documented as well. Uh, I believe a couple of years ago, Nebraska Wildlife Rehab took one in that was an albino possum. And I think she had babies. Um, but there was a photo going around a while ago of an albino um, possum that was here in Nebraska. So um, it's not unusual by any means. A lot of animals can be albino. They usually just don't make it to adulthood because they stick out and they don't have that camouflage to them. All right, so um, their legs are usually covered with black hair. They're sometimes hard to see because they are kind of small. Their ears are completely hairless, as you can see in this photo here. Uh, they're usually black, and then the tips of them are usually a pinkish color or a whitish color. Um, this possum actually looks very nice. A lot of times when we see possums, especially in Nebraska and even northern ranges, their ears and their feet and their tail are sometimes frostbitten. Um, so these animals... Um, evolutionary were from a very warm climate. Um, so even animals like these guys that have been in Nebraska for a very long time, um, they can get frostbite. So um, we see this with a lot of armadillos as well. So armadillos are more of a southern species, but with climate change, they have been moving into Nebraska. Um, they can make it through the winter, but those very extreme cold times, we will see armadillos that have frostbitten ears. Um, so it just happens. This, um, Animals just aren't quite adapted to those um, very, very cold environments. Um, but these guys, their tails are mostly naked except for a few of those bristly hairs. And like I mentioned earlier, they have that opposable thumb on the hind foot and then a prehensile tail.
Um, here's a picture of their foot. So it's super weird. Um, this is their opposable thumb. So that means that they have a thumb that can grip very similar to a person and then their little nails. Um, so like I mentioned earlier, that track, if you ever see a track in the mud or in the snow, it's very identifiable. Um, so you can tell that it's a possum. So super weird foot, um, but it is really unique. All right, so I mentioned that they were marsupials. So these are very interesting animals. They are the only marsupial native to North America. So this mentioned earlier, the female will have a pouch, um, very similar to like a kangaroo or a, walmat, a wombat. They will give birth to underdeveloped young, um, and then they finish and complete their development in the mother's pouch, which is called the marsupium. Um, this is located on the underside, kind of between her hind legs. Um, it's kind of small to see. And if you're not looking, you're not looking for it, you won't be able to see it. Um, sometimes what happens though, is we see a lot of roadkill possums um, and they do have babies. Um, once, you know, you lay the possum out, it's pretty easy to identify that pouch, but it's not like a big pocket on your shirt or anything like that. It's kind of hard to tell. Um, the pouch is small. It's uh, not fully formed in females that have not had a litter yet. Um, they just haven't had to use it. But once they've had one litter, that pouch kind of fully forms. Um, possums that have a fully formed pouch, we know that they've had at least one litter in their life. And then once a female is pregnant, the pouch will enlarge to prepare, prepare for the birth of her young. Um, the possum pouch can also be used to protect the offspring. So once they are a little old enough to go outside of the pouch, they can come back in if they can all fit um, and be safe in that pouch. Uh, very similar to a kangaroo. Little babies are called joeys, which is kind of neat. All right, so reproduction. So females usually reproduce during the first of the year after they are born. So they have a very, very quick sexual maturity. They only live one to three years, so it makes sense that they would. Um, the females can produce usually two litters, sometimes three, usually one in the winter, one in the spring. Um, gestation is only about 12 to 13 days. So very different than like nine months for a human. Um, 12 to 13 days is not really anything, but we also have to think about that's not it. She's not done. She has to be able to keep those underdeveloped young men in her pouch for a while longer so that they can fully form. Um, so when they are born, um, when they go to this pouch, they only weigh one one hundredth of an ounce and they're about the size of a honeybee. So very, very tiny. They look like little jelly beans. Um, how do they get into the pouch? They use their sense of smell. So the mom will have a very distinct sense of smell that they will use to find that marsupium or that pouch. Um, <coughs> excuse me. She can have up to about 20 young at a time but more than likely 20 young are not gonna survive. Um, they have an average of about 13 nipples, so the mom will. Um, so if you think about it, only 13 of those can maybe survive and the ones that can get to that food source are the ones that are going to survive. Normally, not even the 13 will survive, Usually um, when you see a possum with a pouch full of babies, she has anywhere from five to seven. Five would be um, pr actually pretty a lot. Seven is like an outrageous number, but I've seen seven on pictures before. So we know that it does happen. Um, so uh, it just kind of depends. They have way more young than they usually can care for, um, but it helps to ensure that they can at least have some babies. All right, so young possums, after only about two months, the possums are pretty much sufficiently developed, then they're able to venture outside the mother's pouch. Um, on average, like I mentioned, usually seven young will su survive to emerge from the pouch. Um, and after this, normally, after they leave the pouch, you can see them riding on the mom. Um, how great of a mom is it that she will carry her babies on her back? Um, wolf spiders will do this too. They have a lot more, they weigh a lot less, but um, possums will do it as well. Um, they do not hang from their tail, suspended over her back as people thought. Um, they also can hang for just a few seconds seconds um, after um, using their tail when they're born. They're usually um, still pretty heavy and their tail's not fully strengthened yet. But like you mentioned, adults cannot hang by their tail. Babies can do it for a short period of time. Um, but then usually once about three to four months of age, they disperse and they're able to go off on their own and fend for themselves. And then like you mentioned earlier, um, babies are called joeys, which is adorable. Um, one of the problems is that 
females, moms can only carry so much weight on their back. Um, so if they're going and something happens and one falls off, that's, um, they're kind of SOL at that point. So, um, the mom usually does not go get them because she does not want to risk her life and her baby's life to go get one, um, when she has others. So another reason why she has sometimes such a large litter. All right. What do these guys eat? Um, if you've ever seen a possum, they pretty much eat anything. So they are opportunists. They eat, um, a very wide range of foods. Insects are kind of a staple for them, but they will eat fruits, apples, plums, berries. They'll scavenge garbage cans, bird seed, pet food. Um, I've seen lots of possums like sitting on one of the, uh, platform bird feeders. That's not unusual. <clears throat> they will sit there a lot. They'll eat small mammals. They'll eat dead animals, crustaceans, reptiles, and amphibians. I mean, you name it, anything. They've also been known to raid chicken houses. I've seen a lot of people post on social media about possums getting into their chicken houses and maybe eating young chickens, small chickens, large chickens, the eggs, pretty much anything. It's like a gourmet buffet in there if one gets in. Um, they will also take garden crops. It's not unusual to see them munching on like a zucchini or a tomato or something like that. Um, and so it's, it's not unusual. Uh, they're also prey for quite a few other animals, um, larger animals like bobcats, coyotes, um, great horned owls have been known to take them. Humans sometimes eat possums. Like I've never had one, but people do eat them as well. So humans could be considered a predator for them. All right, their teeth. Uh, earlier I mentioned that they have 50 teeth, more than any other terrestrial North American mammal. Um, throughout their life, like a lot of other mammals, they go through two sets of teeth. Uh, their first set is called the deciduous or the milk teeth. They get reabsorbed into the jaw, which in the first few months of their life, remember they only live one to three years. So a lot of things are kind of sped up. The process of their development is sped up to a lot of other animals, um, but they have a ton of incisors. So when you think about it, um, you're your teeth right here. Those are your incisors. Um, so when they open their mouth, 18 out of their 50 teeth are just incisors. So they're quite small and sometimes they're difficult to see with the mouth open, but they do have quite a bit of them. <clears throat> And they also um, have all their teeth when they're about six months of age. And then when you look at their incisors, they're located at the front of the mouth, like I mentioned. Um, they have 10 what are called maxillary, which are the top ones, and then eight mandibular, which are on the bottom. So they have 10 up here and eight down here, which makes 18. Um, and these incisors, they're small, but they are used for kind of grasping and pulling food off like leaves or insects and getting them into the mouth. Here's a skull of a possum. Um, I couldn't find one that was open and in front, um, but here's their skull. Um, so they have that very long kind of um, pointed snout. And then right here at the beginning, I know it's very hard to see, but here are their incisors. And then these are those big carnassial teeth. They're quite large for being an omnivore and eating really nothing, usually larger than a snake. And then your premolars and then your molars back here. Uh, one thing I do want to point out on their skull as well is this like ridge, this kind of circular ridge that's up on top of their head. Um, this is called the sagittal crest. Uh, last week, if you were on, if you watched the canids episode, we talked about how these animals have such good bite force and chewing power and that they have to have somewhere for these masseter muscles to connect, that would end up being this right here. So it's really interesting to see that they have that. Um, if you ever have a dog or have touched a dog's head, you can feel this little ridge on top of their head. Um, so possums will have this as well. So a lot of times when people find a skull and they're like, oh my gosh, I have no idea what this is. I always tell people, look at the general size. That will give you a huge indication. Look at the teeth. And then I also look at this um, sagittal crest right here. That could be like a dead giveaway telling you what type of animal or what general um, group of animal that you are looking at. So it's kind of interesting. All right. So here, the great picture of their teeth. Um, I mentioned earlier that even with their mouth open, those um, incisors are very hard to see and you can barely see them here. You're seeing more of the carnassials and the molars and the uh, premolars, but again, 50 teeth rolling around in that mouth. So like I mentioned, they have a very impressive set of canine teeth. The premolars and the molars, <coughs> 
excuse me, the premolars, they have a gap um, called the diastema that's between the canine teeth and their first premolar. Um, they have 12 total of them. And then they have a single cusp. And these are the ones that are really instrumental in the chewing process. The molars, they have 16 molars. They're known as tricuspids because they have three cusps or tips with them. And then they do have a flat area inside called the basin, which is in the middle of the tooth. Um, one of the things that's neat is when they chew, the bottom molars interlock with the cusps of the top uh, molars, and this helps giving them excellent cutting and kind of that masticating surface. So there's a lot going on in this mouth, but um, they're perfectly evolved to eat what they eat. So their teeth are very interesting. They're so cool. All right, this is like the derpiest picture of a possum that I could find, but um, I have a point in it, I promise. Um, if you've ever seen a cross-eyed possum or a picture of this, you think it's like a joke or someone just caught the animal looking at the wrong time when they took the photo. Truth is that females will store fat behind their eyes. Um, so most possums hold fat in their tails, which is not unusual. A lot of animals do that. Um, but female possums are actually prone to storing fat behind their eyeballs. So you can kind of see it in this photo. The eye looks like chunky or it looks like it's going to burst. So that white part is actually fat being pushed up, um, to your, to the eye. So, um, a lot of animals, especially possums that live in captivity, they're overfed and they get usually live way longer in the wild. Um, they don't have to forage as hard for food. They don't have predators. So they have a pretty easy time just eating and then they don't have to wear off that food. Um, once the fat has been deposited in the eye, it's nearly impossible to get rid of it. Um, but usually we only see this in the ones in captivity. Um, I do remember I interned at the Omaha Zoo and they had a possum there. His name was Dutch and Dutch had very cross-eyed eyes. Um, and I had no idea fat was stored in their eyes. Um, but it's really interesting. Um, and so I wanted to share that with you. I had no idea until I worked, um, there and saw like this really cross-eyed possum, but that's what it means. All right, so that was a little just about their morphology and their appearance, their history. So I just have a few more things I wanna to talk to you about. Um, so their habitat. So where are we finding these animals? They're very common in North America. I'm sure all of us have seen one or seen um, evidence of a possum around, but they are native to, native to Central America and Southern United States. Possums, like I mentioned earlier, their range within this past 100 years has expanded, like very, very much expanded. Um, they now extend all the way to Ontario, Canada. Um, the ones in the northern part of the country, they have a little bit harder time, like I mentioned, um, with the frostbite, just simply because it gets a little bit colder up there. But now we can even find them all along to the Pacific coast. Um, I'm so sorry. I've been sick, so I've been trying to keep my voice going. Um, now exists all along the Pacific coast. Um a lot of people sometimes have a disagreement about the ones that are found on the Pacific coast. Um, <clears throat> are they ones that were introduced? Did they actually move that far? So there's kind of been a debate about those, but those populations, were they introduced or did they happen to just expand their range out there? Um, and like I mentioned, the ones that are in those northern ranges, they can really um, be limited because of that cold weather. Sometimes they starve to death or sometimes they will get frostbite on their tail, on their ears or on their feet. All right, so what's their home range look like? It's usually about 50 to 300 acres. Depends on the possum. It depends on where they're living. But usually you will see them in kind of forested area. They like brushy cover. They're not the largest predator out there, so they still need somewhere to hide. And they usually are around water. Um, if you looked at a map of Nebraska, trying to find out where a possum would be, more than likely, you will see them in pretty much anywhere but the sand hills. I'm not saying that they're not in the sand hills. They're less likely to be in the sand hills area than they are in other portions of Nebraska. Um, but they can live in urban, suburban, and rural habitats. Um, they do not hibernate, so they are around all year long. They create sleeping dens in lots of places like cavities of trees, logs, sheds, barns, sometimes a lot around people. It's just a great way for them to find food and find a warm place to, um, to live. <coughs> All right. This is something we see 
possums and we know possums do this. So when I say playing possum, it's the wrong type of possum, but that's what they call it. It's, it's the P word, not the O word, but this is their most famous defense mechanism. So they play dead or they play possum. So many people believe that possums just do this um, on their own free will to scare away other animals thinking that they're dead. Truth is it's not their own free will. It's actually their body going into a catatonic state because of fear. So they're so scared that they literally just fall over. <laughs> um, so one of the things is usually when possums do this, they have been attacked or they have been caught completely unaware and they are just absolutely terrified. Um, more than likely, when you see a possum, they're going to run the other way. They're not going to mess with you. You're a lot bigger than them. Um, they might hiss. They might growl. There's a few other defense mechanisms that they can do. Um, they bare their teeth sometimes in a really dangerous situation, but Oftentimes, it's not too hard for a predator to overpower a possum. They don't weigh a lot. They really, like, besides the teeth, they don't they do not do a lot. Um, so when they do this, it's because they are absolutely terrified. <laughs> um, so what will happen is they just drop to the ground, and then either they stare off into space, or they will completely close their eyes like they are dead. The body will go limp, their breathing appears to stop, they sometimes will discharge their bowels, their tongue sticks out, they drool, they look to be dead. Um, if you poke them, if you, um, like, uh, sometimes animals, if they try to eat them, they li literally will not move. They cannot move. Um, there's been stories and papers I read that sometimes animals have even broken bones and they will not wake up. So they are completely out. Um, it's basically the body's response to catatonic. It's a catatonic state because of fear. So um, they are literally immobile um, and they do not wake up until minutes or sometimes hours later. <laughs> the animal doesn't feel any pain. They have no reflexes. Like I mentioned, they even stop blinking. Um, they will not respond no matter what the animal does. So why do they do this? Usually animals are turned off by dead prey. It smells, it looks disgusting. It sometimes carries diseases. Animals usually try and stay away from that unless you're a turkey vulture. They usually try and stay away from that. So over time, it's just an evolutionary tactic that keeps other animals from consuming diseased food. Um, usually if animals do that, they see this plain possum, they will just give up and be like, okay, I'm done. I'll go find something else. Um, it just depends on the animal. Um, it takes a few minutes, sometimes to a few hours before they're mobile again, um, but they can survive these encounters. But oftentimes you will see a lot of scars on possums or um, they're limping or there's chunks taken out of them. Usually that happens when they're in this catatonic state. They usually are injured sometimes. Um, sometimes they're not, they can survive and be just fine. Um, but there's sometimes there's a lot of injury that comes with this. All right, the drooling aspect is another defense mechanism that possums will do. So this is instead of like, I'm terrified, some things that they can do if they're not that terrified yet, um, they can get drooling. Um, if you see an animal drooling, um, even another animal, a person, you automatically think that something is off about this animal. It's diseased, it's, it has a, a disease on it, it something's wrong with it. The an normal animals just don't drool like that. Um, so what they will do, um, it doesn't sound like a lot, but it usually is a great way to get predators um, to leave them alone. Um, if an animal sees you drooling, they often think that you're sick and diseased and they will not touch you. Um, so to get drooling, the possum will move its jaws from side to side and up and down. It stimulates the salivary glands in their mouth and they start drooling. Um, once like the drool starts to come out, the predator is usually like, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go find something else here. There's another tactic called alligator teeth. Um, basically, it's what this possum is doing here. Um, this is when a possum faces with a predator. Um, it draws its gums back. It shows their ferocious looking teeth. They may even growl or hiss just to kind of showcase how um, scary they can be. Um, but the teeth are really just for show. Um, because they have these really large canines and this look, it often enables the possum to scare the animal enough to get away. All right. So there's a few myths that go along with possums. Um, some of them you may have heard of before. There's one that is crazy that I have never heard, and I can't wait to share it with you. Um, but rabies. So <laughs> possums are mammals. 
Um, any mammal can contract rabies. Um, there's a lot of myths out there saying that possums are immune to rabies. This is not true. They are mammals. Um, they are not placental mammals. They are marsupials. So they're slightly different. There have been documented cases of possums that have had rabies, but possums are one of the few mammalian species less likely to contract rabies. Um, we believe because that they have a little bit slightly lower body temperature than most placental mammals. Um, Normally in Nebraska, the animals that we see that carry the most rabies are going to be skunks um, and foxes. Um, so we see quite a few of those animals and raccoons that have those, <coughs> excuse me, that have rabies, usually not possums, but I'm not saying that it can't happen. It's just less likely. Um, these animals will also normally utilize like woodchuck or skunk burrows, um, which are animals that can contract rabies. Um, they inhabit sometimes these complex den structures so um, usually their odds are really reduced for transmitting the rabies, which makes them kind of a cool, suitable neighbor for these susceptible species. All right, so their impact on Lyme disease. So I was also one of these people up until a few years ago, someone uh, told me and showed me a paper that said, this is not, not necessarily true. So um, the idea is that ticks or um, possums will eat a bunch of ticks and they prevent the spread of Lyme disease. This is not completely false, but it's just the way that it's worded. So um, on April 18th, 2014, what's called the Cary Institute of Ecosystem Studies, they published this article that focused on the role that opossums play in the spread of Lyme disease and their role in the ecosystem. Um, so they pulled information from a different study in 2009 that said about 95% of ticks that latch onto the possum have the potential to be consumed. Um, that's quite a bit. And all we, as we all outdoor enthusiasts know that Lyme disease is a huge, sometimes barrier for people getting outside. Um, it, no one wants to contract it. Ticks are the ones that carry it. Um, <clears throat> Recently, this 95% of ticks that consume have the potential to be consumed by these possums has been like grossly taken out of proportion by the um, mainstream America, basically. Um, so in about the mitigation and the uh, remediation of Lyme disease. So basically possums, they may consume ticks, not necessarily a case of them actively seeking out ticks um, on the forest floor. And then not all ticks that are found on possums necessarily carry Lyme disease. So it's not like these animals are going out and eating the ticks because they know they prevent Lyme disease. Um, so there's a little bit of just kind of like a misconception about ticks and Lyme disease and possums. Um, but the idea that possum consumes ticks is vastly different from the misconception that they prevent the spread of Lyme disease. Um, so we talked about like the findings above that I mentioned, um, the possum's impact on, for instance, like the black-legged tick consumption is not really substantial enough to control a localized tick population. So it leaves really little evidence saying that the possum controls the spread and the transmission of Lyme disease. So um, that may not be enough for you to um, convince you on this, but it's just the way that people have taken this and kind of run with it. We're not saying that they don't do something, but they're not the ones out there continuously um, keeping Lyme disease in check. All right, another one is hanging by the tails. We have kind of talked about this earlier. There's lots of uh, tails surrounding like the functionality, the shape, the reason that they have these tails. Um, they do not hang like bats. They do not do it overnight. We mentioned earlier, young possums are smaller. They're less heavy. They're capable of hanging for very short periods of time, like a few seconds. Adults cannot do this simply because they are too heavy. Um, they absolutely, like, they're not capable of carrying the weight of the animal on a tree branch. So that one we've kind of dispelled a little bit earlier, but I wanted to put it in this section as well. All right, this one, immune to venom. So <clears throat> this one, there's a myth and a kind of, it's not a myth, but um, it's a, a phrase, I guess, that's going around saying possums are immune to snake venom. Um, we've known really since the 40s that possums possess some level of immunity to some types of snake venoms. Um, basically, there was a lab experiment with mice, and this team discovered 
the exact molecule, which was a peptide in the possum's blood that can neutralize snake venom. Um, so the peptide worked against several species of snakes, including the American Western Diamondback rattlesnake and the India's Russell Viper. Um, so certain types of snakes will have certain cocktails of venom. Um, all snakes are different, all species are different. So there are certain species in which they have a natural immunity to. There's quite a few animals like honey badger, um, ground squirrel. Some ground squirrels have the immunity to certain types of snake venom. Um, they just have that natural immunity. So we know this for a while, but possums do have a natural immunity to certain types of snakes. All right, <clears throat> this is the craziest myth that I've ever heard. I had no idea, but I saw this a few times and I, I just I just had to share. So one of the weirdest myths about possums is that people thought and still sometimes think that they can give birth out of their nostrils. Um, this is completely false. Um, so female possums, um, <clears throat> in order to get the um, the babies to come up um, to the marsupium or to their pouch, she will lick it to start initiating them moving. And then they use that sense of smell to move up to the marsupium into the pouch. Um, sometimes when they do this, they make this weird sneezing noise. And then people would look and all of a sudden there would be babies like coming up into the pouch. So people thought, oh, they sneeze out their nose and babies are there. Um, completely false. We know that this is not true. Um, it just, it happens to that when they do that, they come into the pouch. There's also the male portion as well that made more people believe this. So possums, the males, marsupials, they have a two-pronged penis, <clears throat> which actually fits a lot of people think into the nostrils of the female. Um, so like many marsupials, they claimed that this organ fit perfectly into the female's nostrils. And then a while later she would sneeze and give birth. So um, this one is not as like out there. I think a lot of people have realized that this is completely not true, but I did see it in quite a few papers and I just had to share it with you. So apparently this is something that people thought. All right, so I do wanna talk a little bit about management. I have about two or three slides left here. Um, a lot of people might be thinking, what do we have to talk about management? Possums, they're everywhere. Well, yes, um, because that they are sometimes considered a nuisance or a pest, they're around a lot of people. They do well in suburban and urban areas. They're gonna be around people sometimes. So because they are so adaptable, there are often gonna be conflicts between people and possums, other possums and other animals, it's just going to happen. Um, a lot of people don't like them because they will opt opportunistically feed on the eggs of certain things like chicken, turkeys, quail. Um, a lot of people talk about their backyard chickens being raided because of possums. Um, there was a lot of people and a lot of um, animosity towards these animals because they believe that the predation of these nests um, because of these mammals, um, they thought that this was why the low game bird population. So a lot of people will blame small mammals, um, medium sized mammals, I guess, on like turkey populations being low, pheasant populations being low. This is absolutely not true. There's tons of other reasons that they're low. It's definitely not just because of possums or raccoons. They do eat them, but they are not the sole reason that those game bird populations have dipped. Um, so there are human conflicts too. They are around a lot of people. We know people have seen them in their houses, they've in their garages or their attics. They walk on fence lines. Um, my uncle had one in his dryer vent a uh, long time ago now, but <clears throat> he ran the dryer and had to get a new dryer because the possum would go in his, yeah, and you know what happens, but um, they can cause pop property damage. They create entrance holes. They sometimes tear insulation. They're not rodents, but they do chew on wires, not as uh, much as like a rodent or a mouse, but they do defecate sometimes in unacceptable or places where people do not want them to defecate. They can carry one type of parasite that can cause a serious disease in equines or in horses. It's called EPM. Um, so some people do not like them for that reason. Um, they can also carry ticks, fleas, roundworms, other common parasites. Um, a lot of reasons that people will see them next to um, houses or around, around like apartment buildings where there's lots of people, there's lots of trash, a lot of pet food, people store things outside um, that they could be in. So at some point, there's going to be some conflict between humans and possums. So what can you do to remove or help with this conflict? Um, remove what's attracting them. So 
<laughs> a lot of people will feed their outside cats, their dogs outside, um, bring your pet food in at night since they are most active at night, they're nocturnal, bring in your pet food at night or store it in a bin where they cannot get to it. Um, place garbage containers with a sealed lid on them um, and make sure all the trash is secure. Um, close any access points to denning areas, your attics, your garages, your crawl spaces. Um, this one is kind of hard for me to say, like remove brushy piles of wood and rocks. This is also good for pollinators and lots of bee species. So, um, but it is shown that a lot of animals will live in those brushy piles and rocks around your yard. So just make sure that things are cleaned up um, if you do not want those possums around. So there's always conflicts and management with lots of different animals. Possums just seem to be one of those that a lot of people have issues with. Um, so I hope that today you learned quite a bit about possums. Um, I'm sorry for the coughing and the dying, but I'm doing my best here. Um, we have one more science of um, next week venom and poison. So talking about the differences between venomous animals and what makes up venom and poisonous animals and plants and things and what makes up poison. So talking about the differences and similarities. Uh, that's our last one for the year. Um, but I'm working currently on figuring out some topics for next year. Uh, so if you have something that you're like, Monica, please do a science of this. Um, when I send those evaluations out to everyone that registered, please fill out that survey monkey evaluation. Let me know how I did, um, and then also give me some ideas that you would really like to see for next year. So I have some ideas that I really do want to see, but you are the ones that watch continuously. So please help me out and let me know. If you like um, what you just saw, there's a ton of stuff on YouTube. We have a lot of different educational videos. We have a lot of playlists. We have Nature Nerd Nights. We have some stuff like Nature Journaling. The Science of Playlist has a ton of videos that we've done before. So if you're like, I really want to see a science of birds, there's birds on there. Um, there might be what you're looking for already. We have a really active social media account, Facebook and Instagram. So check those out, Nebraska Wildlife Education. And the Nebraska Wildlife Education website, we have like downloadable activities. We have trunks that you can check out, um, interactive trunks and PowerPoints and lots of cool stuff. All right. So that's what I have here. Um, let's go ahead and check the chat to see if I can possibly answer questions or what comments that you have. Um, oh gosh, people like possums. Um, okay. <coughs> Ooh, okay, someone, thank you. Can the pea possums use their tails to hang? Um, yes, some of them can, especially in places like Australia. Um, South America, I believe, has some as well, but I'm really more familiar with the Australia ones. Yes, they are a little bit more able to use that prehensile tail to, to hang to things, but it's definitely not going to be like a bat, if that's what people think. Um, if they get too fat, will their eyeballs pop out? I don't know. That's a really good question. Um, I don't think that's how it happens. My guess is that their eyes just expand um, and they're just very obese at that point. Um, someone asked like fainting goats. Um, I think so. That's a good question, Nathan, about how they play possum. Um, what is their temperature range tolerance? I, that's a good question. I have no idea what their specific range tolerance is. Um, I would assume that in places like South America um, or Central America, it gets rather hot. I think what we would have to worry more about of is that frostbite. So, and I do know that like those crawl spaces, those attics, those garages, they're going in there because they need somewhere warm um, or sometimes cool. So I'm not sure of that exact temperature range though. We see an injured possum. How can we truly help if know if they are diseased or need help? Um, good question. The first thing I would always tell people is never touch it um, just because you have no idea. Um, and it's just the safest option for you and the animal. You can always call someplace like Nebraska Wildlife Rehab um, and let them know about what's going on. Um, there have been a lot of people I know that see um, possum babies like the mom has been hit on the side of the road and there's babies, they will call Nebraska Wildlife Rehab and they will come get those animals um, and, and help out those babies. So good question. Um, what other animals do not get rabies often? Uh, it's like I mentioned, any mammal can contract rabies, but it's just those animals like the marsupials. Um, there's animals that are more prone to getting it. Like I don't really see a deer have rabies quite a bit. It's more of those animals like foxes, coyotes, skunks, raccoons, more of those animals. Um, but again, any mammal can get rabies. Um, there's just some that are less likely to get rabies. 
Um, someone asked, how do we know if the possum needs help or it's okay? Um, I always just tell people to leave the animal alone. Um, if you're worried about it, you can monitor it for a while. If the animal doesn't get up within a few hours, you can probably just assume that they are deceased. Um, however, if they are get up and walk away within a few minutes or a few hours, you probably know that they were just in that catatonic state. Uh, is their eyesight bad? I didn't find a lot of information about their eyesight for some reason. So um, in my opinion, I would say it's probably not the best, um, but I don't know. I did not find a lot of information expelling about that. So can they see color? I have no idea. That's a good question too. Uh, sense of smell. Again, did not find a lot about that. Um, their sight or their smell. It was mostly about their weird adaptations and their marsupialness that they have. I would like to look that up as well. Um, someone asked if our trunks are available outside the state. Um, not at this time. We just have Nebraska resources, but I know a lot of other um, state agencies have resources available. It would just be contacting your local state um, wildlife agency um, or sometimes cities will also have that as well. All right, thank you, well done. Um, I wish there were more Nature Nerd Night episodes too. Um, we thought about doing a podcast and then we had some um, staff changes, but with the new year, maybe there will be some new um, programs coming up as well. So, um, all right, so someone said that they have a possum. Um, we don't know if it's fine to release them. So, I would definitely not release them. Um, there is a lot of animals have, um, there's regulation that you can't take animals home um, and a wild animals home. Um, there's lots of permits sometimes that you have to go through. I'm not specific on all of them. What I would probably tell you to do is go talk to Nebraska Wildlife Rehab um, and give that animal to them. They are the ones that are kind of capable of taking care of that and would probably know the next steps. Um, it would just be Nebraska Wildlife Rehab. If you Google them um, and speak to someone in person on the phone, um, that would be probably my best guess. A lot of people always ask if Demon Parks will take them. We do not take live animals. Those That would be my best response for you is that one. Um, some, yep, some, we, we thought about a podcast. Someone asked that. Um, we have a couple episodes, really good episodes um, recorded. So maybe in 2024, we will release them. So, all right. Thanks, everyone. Um, hopefully, we will see you next week. We're for our last episode of the year, um, Venom and Poison. So, of course, we'll be talking about snakes probably poison ivy, um, a lot of cool stuff. So please join us 3 to 4 p.m. next week. We will see you. Um, and I will send that email hopefully out later today or Monday about the registration link for next week and then the video um, for this one. So thanks, everyone. Appreciate it. We'll see you next week. Thank you. Bye, everyone.